أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن أظلم ممن كذب على الله وكذب بالصدق إذ جاءه أليس في جهنم مثوى للكافرين والذي جاء بالصدق وصدق به أولئك هم المتقون لهم ما يشاءون عند ربهم ذلك جزاء المحسنين ليكفر الله عنهم أسوأ الذي عملوا ويجزيهم بأحسن الذي كانوا يعملون أليس الله بكاف عبده ويخوفونك بالذين من دونه ومن يضلل الله فما له من هاد ومن يهد الله فما له من مضل أليس الله بعزيز ذي انتقام ولئن سألتهم من خلق السماوات والأرض ليقولن الله قل أفرأيتم ما تدعون من دون الله إن أرادني الله بضر هل هن كاشفات ضره أو أرادني برحمة هل هن ممسكات رحمته قل حسبي الله عليه يتوكل المتوكلون قل يا قوم اعملوا على مكانتكم إني عامل سوف تعلمون من يأتيه عذاب يخزيه ويحل عليه عذاب مقيم إنا أنزلنا عليك الكتاب للناس بالحق فمن اهتدى فلنفسه ومن ضل فإنما يضل عليها وما أنت عليهم بوكيل الله يتوفى الأنفس حين موتها والتي لم تمت في منامها فيمسك التي قضى عليها الموت ويرسل الأخرى إلى أجل مسمى إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون أم اتخذوا من دون الله شفعاء قل أولو كانوا لا يملكون شيئا ولا يعقلون قل لله الشفاعة جميعا له ملك السماوات والأرض ثم إليه ترجعون وإذا ذكر الله وحده شما أزد قلوب الذين لا يؤمنون بالآخرة وإذا ذكر الذين من دونه إذا هم يستبشرون قل اللهم فاطر السماوات والأرض عالم الغيب والشهادة أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون ولو أن للذين ظلموا ما في الأرض جميعا ومثله معه لافتدوا به لافتدوا به من سوء العذاب يوم القيامة وبدا لهم من الله ما لم يكونوا يحتسبون وبدا لهم سيئات ما كسبوا 
وبدا لهم سيئات ما كسبوا وحاق بهم ما كانوا به يستهزئون وإذا مس الإنسان ضر دعانا ثم إذا خولناه نعمة منا قال إنما أوتيته على علم بل هي فتنة ولكن أكثرهم لا يعلمون قد قالها الذين من قبلهم فما أغنى عنهم ما كانوا يكسبون فأصابهم سيئات ما كسبوا والذين ظلموا من هؤلاء سيصيبهم سيئات ما كسبوا وما هم بمعجزين أولم يعلموا أن الله يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah to bless every single one of us My beloved mothers and sisters A beautiful day in a beautiful country To be honest the weather here is somehow one of the best in the world and we need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this every time we happen to go out of the country and I'm sure it happens to most of us if not all of us we tend to appreciate the gift of Allah upon us and one of them that we have that others do not have is just the simple weather as cold as it might be today believe me it's actually brilliant weather compared to other places may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who can ponder reflect and be thankful and grateful so that we can get more because one of the keys of the doors of achieving more is to thank Allah you thank Allah you open one more door you thank him more you open another door you thank him even more and you open many more doors so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the doors of mercy for us and the doors of goodness and sustenance and to close all the doors of evil and to protect us from everyone who intends harm especially shaitan himself i mean my mothers and sisters the beginning verses of the 24th part of the quran and this is uh, part of surah az-zumar which is the 39th surah of this beautiful quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the liars and those who belie the messengers so there are two two things here one is those who lie and one is those who do not accept the truth so when a person lies they f- cannot distinguish between falsehood and truth so they begin to believe lies and they begin to think that that which is the truth is actually a lie so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says quite clearly so who is more unjust than one who lies about allah number one he lies about allah so he's a liar this is verse number 32 Uh, of the surah and this is a warning for all of us to abstain and protect ourselves from lies and falsehood may allah forgive us and may he strengthen us and may he make us people who are truthful and upright because a person lies until they begin to lie against allah and about allah they said allah has daughters na'udhu billah they were referring to the angels they said that allah has a son na'udhu billah they were referring to jesus allah says how dare they invent a lie so allah says so who is more unjust than the one who lies not just ordinary lies but lies about allah and denies the truth when it comes to him so this is part of arrogance as explained by the hadith of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says that a person will never enter paradise if they have in their heart even a mustard seed's weight worth of pride so the sahaba radhiyallahu anhum asked him you know we all love to dress and we all love our our conveyance and so on he said that is not what is being referred to by the term pride here what is being referred to is despising people and rejecting the truth so this is what pride is so a person who rejects the truth no space in paradise for them until they serve their sentence in the jail and that jail happens to be hell fire may allah protect us so sometimes people say that allah is very unmerciful na'udhu billah may allah safeguard us because how can he have hell fire when he calls himself most merciful well you might live in the best country 
the best country in the world, but they have a jail. The jail is to penalize people who go against the law that does not make it the worst country or a bad country. But to be honest, any country and every place in the world has, uh, you know, a jail. In fact, every maybe school or home would have a little uh, naughty corner or something of that nature where you perhaps might want to punish your own children. It does not mean that you are, don't love them, nor does it mean you're not merciful, but it means that they deserve to be punished sometimes uh, in a specific way or reprimanded or corrected, or however you'd like to look at it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. So Allah says, who is more unjust than one who lies about Allah and denies the truth when it comes to him? Is there not in hell a residence for such or for the disbelievers, for such people, those who disbelieve? When the truth comes to you, accept it, hands down. So one might ask, how do I know what the truth is? Well, if you are a truthful person, you'll be, be able to pick up the truth. If you are a truthful person, you'll be able to realize that Allah is the all truthful. He made me. How can he lie to me? So when Allah says, worship me alone, not only does it make sense, but that is the truth. You worship your maker alone. Do not render an act of worship for a stick, a stone, a tree, an animal, or a human being. You render, or, or an angel or anything else, you render it solely for the one who made you. That's what Islam is all about. And this is the truth, the truth. So if you look at the Quran, for example, it is the book. There is no other book that can come close to its authenticity. So even if we were to debate today to say, which is the word of Allah, we would come up with an undisputed conclusion that the most authentic is the Quran. It's more authentic than any other book available on earth today. And it is it dates back as far as the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. correct. But it has in it that which is undisputedly accurate. Accurate meaning the, 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 the book has not been changed over time. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this deep understanding. No other book has this happened to. And this is an open challenge to everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really and truly grant us the knowledge of his book because it is only through the knowledge of the book that we will be able to learn more about the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the true sense and we will be able to adopt the deen and inshallah project it to others such that when we die we do not regret. So my mothers and sisters here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the very next verse and the one who has brought the truth meaning the prophet peace be upon him and they who believed in it those are the righteous so who is the righteous the prophet is the righteous and those who believed in him and in the book the one who brought the book and the people who believed in the book those are the righteous because if you look at the message of the book it tells you to be good to be kind to worship your maker alone to reach out to others in a beautiful way your neighbors your parents and so on your children male female not to cheat not to deceive not to steal not to call each other names not to backbite not to slander not to engage in gossip all these laws are the ingredients of contentment in this world and success in the hereafter so you want success in the hereafter and you want contentment here, stay away from gossip, from slander, from hurting people, from attacking people unjustly and so on and so forth and all the other laws of the Quran. Allah says those who believed in this book and those who are the one who brought this truth, the true message, the messenger himself, the ones who accepted him and it. They are the ones who are righteous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them. Allah says, they will have whatever they desire with their Lord. That is the reward of the doers of good. Pause there for a moment. This is speaking about Jannah, paradise. In this world, nobody will have whatever they desire. Ultimately, you have to die. I have to die. You have health matters. I have perhaps health matters. May Allah grant us all cure. Some, it's just a little bit of a cough, whilst others, it's a little bit more serious. May Allah grant cure to all. And some people might have economic problems, financial issues, social issues, all other issues. Part of the test of life. You have only been dipped into this dunya in order to test you, and then you come out of the swimming pool, basically. So this dunya is like a little pool. Dive in, and a little while later, you have to jump, you have to jump out on the other side. Some can swim fast, some swim slow, some know how to swim, some don't know how to swim. Some have taken instruction, some haven't. Allahu Akbar. So the success lies in those who take instruction from Allah. 
Because this little deception known as this life, it's actually so short that people die. When you came into the world, you came with nothing. When you leave, you leave with absolutely nothing besides your deeds. So between, between the point of birth and death, all you need to do is pack away as many deeds as possible so that when you leave, you can have the gold medal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us. May Allah make it easy for us. So if anyone told you that this life is what there is and it's the only thing you have, they're actually deceived because you can never have what you want in this world. Never, ever, ever. Not even one. Nobody. Not at all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand this. So if it was really something worth it, we would be able to have a lot more than we actually do. But Allah says, hang on, you're just going to have a small droplet, even a fraction of a droplet, uh, whilst you're in this world and make use of it, convert it into deeds. When you come to us, Allah says, you have what you want. Now, why I said I pause there for a moment, people argue, will I have this in Jannah? Will I have that in Jannah? Will I have this in paradise? Will this be mine in paradise? The truth is, get there. You will never be displeased. Nor will you regret. Because Allah says, whatever you think of there will be yours. Yours, completely. So, you might not think of certain things that you desperately wanted in this world when you were in paradise or when you get to paradise or when I get to paradise or when we get to paradise because perhaps there will be so much better that we won't even think of insignificant things that we perhaps thought of whilst we were in the world. So in order to get things in paradise, you need to think about them when you are in paradise. So first get there. And when you are there, you'll realize People say, well, if I'm a female, uh, what's the point? I, I, I'd like to be a male. I, I've heard this coming to me as a question as well. And some say, well, I'm a male. I'd like to be a female. Oh, less people say that. But anyway, the truth is, uh, w the, the, the reality is this argument and debate of what's going to be there will make us miss the boat, miss the train. We're arguing about how comfortable the seat in the train is going to be. And guess what? It passed straight in front of us. Gone. Everyone else jumped in and we're still standing at the station. Is that what it is? Well, stop arguing. Get into the train. You'll find the seat better than you'd ever expected. MashaAllah. Massage seat. Alhamdulillah. May Allah grant us goodness. But the truth is, uh, this debate about what is going to be in paradise, all I know is you are going to be happy. You will have what you want. Hey, somebody asked me, will my pet be in paradise? Wallahi, this is a question a lot of people ask. I'm just letting you know. Will my kitten, will my cat be in Jannah with me? Won't I get another look at it? Allahu Akbar. And I think I, the answer is, you will get whatever you desire when you are there. It's over. So I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, because I don't want to puncture your balloon. But all I'm telling you is, work to get there. Once you get there, alhamdulillah, you are there. When you are there, what you think of whilst you are there, Allah will give it to you because He promises you that. So this is why these are. This is one of the verses where Allah promises, and there are so many other verses. Allah says, "And the one who has brought the truth." Uh, okay, that was the previous verse. The next one, Allah says, "They will have whatever they desire with their Lord." That is the reward of the doers of good. It means you need to do good. So we read the verse wrong. Instead of thinking we need to do good so that we can have whatever we desire with our Lord, we start thinking, well, what is it that we're going to get before we start doing good? We need to know what's the deal. It's not a worldly deal where you get a job and they have to tell you your salary before you get the job. No, this is just Allah is giving you something to say whatever you wish for is yours. Okay, let's not harp on this more. But Alhamdulillah, I hope we've understood it and we can move on further to the next verse. By the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will grant us the uh, ability to do good deeds and He will accept them from us and He will forgive our shortcomings. Engage in lots of repentance, my beloved mothers and sisters. And inshallah, you will see the door of Allah opening for you. May, may He open the doors for us all and all those uh, who are struggling. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them ease. Amen. So Allah says that Allah may remove from them the worst of what they did. This is called forgiveness of the bad that you've done. Allah says, you do good, you believe, we will wipe out whatever was in the past. Wiped out, completely, gone. So Allah says, Allah will reward the doers of good 
that Allah may remove from them the worst of what they did. If you follow the message and you believe in the message and the messenger and you are from the group of the believers and you try your best to understand what was revealed to, to you via Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then indeed you will be from amongst those who are mentioned here where Allah says we will remove from them the worst of what they have done and we will re reward them due to the best of what they used to do. Stop again for a moment. You know on the day of judgment there's going to be scales. The scale one side and the other side. So on the right side all your good deeds, on the left side all your bad deeds. If your good deeds are more than your bad, the narrations make mention of the mercy of Allah saying and stating this person goes to paradise. Forget about the little bad that they've done because the good is much more. But the bad deeds when they are more than the good then there is doom or then there is a warning. And this is why my mothers and sisters, you know, when we commit sin, sometimes the sin is calculated per, per split second. So say for example, I'm, and I'm just giving you this example because obviously we need to encourage one another. Say a person is dressed inappropriately, okay? So it's counted per split second. So now we happen to be going into public. So it's counted in such a way that uh, every split second that you dressed inappropriately is uh, written against you. And at the same time, every single uh, person who is attracted in the wrong sense to what you were displaying, uh, that also is now calculated against you. So what happens is it starts adding, you know, like a machine. And one person, two people, five people, ten people, a hundred people, you catch public transport, maybe you walk into the public, you go into a mall, you go into a, you go to a wedding, whatever happens, and you, go, and you don't know that, you know what, the scales are just tipping one way. And all you did was you just read Salah. You read Salah. So on the good side, there was Salah. But on the bad side, there was like ten tons of what? Well, I just dressed inappropriately and I walked out. That's all I did. So, 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 so the argument, you go and you say, Ya Allah, but it was just a day. I just went to this wedding. Allah says, yeah, well, we are not oppressing you. It's your deeds. We told you about it. We, we warned you. We, we, I sent you my own word. I, I really, I sent a messenger to you. I sent the best of creation to you to remind you. I sent people to tell you. So many people told you and you thought, you know what, it's just a minor thing. And I, it's okay. You know, it's one of those things. So it's multiplied and it's multiplied in the sense that every single person who perhaps happened to sin as a result, we received a burden of it. So this is why we say, repent. Ya Allah, forgive me for what I've done. I won't do it again, Ya Allah. The multiplication is what we should be worried about. Because one is to sin in a way that, okay, you've done a sin against yourself. But two is you've sinned in a way that the, the, the other people were also led astray. If that's the case, oh, the burden is too big. So it's, a, it's, it's important that we talk about this time and again because it encourages us to say, look, if I sin on my own, for example, I've done something wrong, maybe uh, that's one thing. But if I've come out in the public with it and I've really uh, assisted others in committing sin or I've diverted them. You know, I know of a young man who once came to me and told me, I, I, I was a youngster who could concentrate quite a bit in salah. But he says, I joined, okay, let's not say exactly what he joined, but he says there was a time when I happened to be in the company of some Muslim girls. And he says, the way they were dressed, he says, every time I would start salah, some silly reason, my concentration would actually go away because these images would come into my mind and I try to fight them. And I succeed sometimes and I fail sometimes. And he says, please give me something to read, you know, that... Uh, could help me, okay, okay. There is a recitation of uh, seeking forgiveness, that's there. And asking Allah and lowering your gaze. This is why lowering the gaze is something very important. If we don't, sometimes we pay a price for it. But uh, the point I want to raise, that seeing that we're speaking to mothers and sisters, is that imagine someone's link with Allah was messed up totally because we decided to just wear something tight to show our backsides in the public. A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah. May Allah safeguard us. And, and this happens. And, and then the guy, and then people are saying, well, why did he look? Well, why did you show it? So look, we're not saying that either one is, you know, less uh, guilty of it. No, we're not saying that. But what we are saying is either one should try their best 
to get closer to Allah so that we don't have to do all these things. And we who believe are different from those who do not believe. We believe that there is accountability. That's what's being spoken about here in these verses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you know, there's going to be a day. And on that day, those who lied and belied, obviously there's doom for them. Those who believed and accepted, there's goodness for them. Here's the goodness. And Allah says, if you tried your best, then what we will do is we will forgive the bad that you've done and we will give you goodness for the good you've done. But let's seek Allah's forgiveness. This is why when we talk of the scales, it's very, very worrisome. Worrisome because uh, we, should, we don't know the bad deeds we've done could be mountains. The good we've done might be so little. Even though we read five salah, say for example, we read five salah a day. Let's be honest, what's the level of concentration? Put it on a percentage. 50%? 40? Less? Because you don't even know the meaning of what you're saying. Sometimes 20% concentration. So we're so happy I've done with my Isha, I've done with my Witr, I did my Fajr, everything. Let's be honest, what concentration did you have? So it's the mercy of Allah that will accept the good deed from us. But we need to strive to try and concentrate more, inshallah, on meanings and so on. Let's move further with these verses. Allah says, Is not Allah sufficient for His servant? أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ Allahu Akbar. This is such a powerful verse. Allah is comforting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They try to harm him. They try to do things to him. And the message is for all of us. People who try to harm us and who try and attack us or who try to do, uh, who try to reach us with harm. Allah says, is Allah not sufficient for his messenger, for his servant? Is Allah not sufficient for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is Allah not sufficient for you, O servant of Allah, whoever you are? Myself, yourselves included, is Allah not enough? This is why we say, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for us, and He is the best disposer of our affairs. So, here is a question a question that has an answer embedded in it that is so comforting. When Allah says, Is Allah not sufficient for His servant? And yet, they threaten you with those they worship besides Allah. And whoever Allah leaves astray, for him there is no guide. Wow. Allah is saying, they're threatening you with all their false gods and deities, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that you know, this uh, stone that we're worshipping, it's going to fix you at night. And this little piece of date that we're worshipping, it's going to sort you out. It's going to bring bad luck to you. And Allah says, but isn't Allah sufficient for you? The question is also to us. Isn't Allah sufficient for us? So why do we end up going to little fortune tellers, witch doctors and so on? Why do we end up going to where it is wrong to go to? Sometimes when we are in problem, when we are in sickness, when we need help, we should turn to Allah. Is Allah not sufficient for you? Allah says, don't be threatened. Don't ever be threatened by those besides Allah. No, don't. It is Allah. He's enough for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. You know, yesterday I said, that everything that happens, happens for a reason, and it's a good reason. And some people were arguing and so on, and I did not bother to respond to them, because the truth is, it is always a good reason. From the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu he says, Ajaban li amri mu'mini fa inna amrahu kullahu lahu khair. You know, amazing are the affairs of a believer. For all his affairs, good or bad, meaning they're always good. Something difficult or something easy, it's always good. <coughs> That is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's, it's something very, very comforting to note that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept us in what we might term negative, in essence, it's actually drawing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it should bring us closer to Him. It should make us people who turn to Allah. So this is why He creates sometimes difficulty in our lives. You know, uh, when there is a lot of ease, we forget Allah. Everyone knows that. I think the verses are going to come uh, after a few of these verses. You will hear a verse where Allah says exactly that. So let's continue. Allah says, Whoever Allah leaves to go astray, for him there is no guide. And whoever Allah guides, for him there is no misleader. 
So my mothers and sisters, you need to have a pure heart. You need to search genuinely for the truth. And you need to constantly ask Allah for guidance. That is when you will be guided. Because Allah guides those who seek genuinely to find the truth. He guides them to the truth. There is nobody ever who searched genuinely for the truth who was not guided. So whilst Allah is telling you that we are the owners of guidance, He also tells you what it is that will lead to achieving his guidance and that is to sincerely search to be genuine towards Allah and to really want the guidance so this is why Allah says وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا those who struggle to come towards us we will guide them to our paths we will show them the road the ways to come close to us we will open the doors of goodness for them but you need to struggle you need to struggle, to search, to hunt, to work towards and so on. And this is when Allah guides. But ultimately, obviously, if Allah has misguided someone or if Allah has left someone to go astray, nobody can bring them back. Nobody can bring them back. You know, we're faced with people nowadays, especially in this new world, that you have children 18, 20 and so on, and suddenly they, they are far astray and the parents are decent people. The parents are religious people, spiritual people. And they'll tell you, you know, I don't know what's happened. I'm so depressed. You've got to tell them, my beloved mother, do not be depressed. Keep on praying. Keep on trying. That's your role. Now the child is an adult. They owe it to Allah. You try your best and you have tried your best. And this is why we say, do not falter from a young age. Do not underestimate the evil power that is being aggressively advertised around today whether it's on the television or the internet or everywhere else, there is a lot of evil going on. May Allah safeguard us from this evil. May He make us religious and spiritual at the same time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our offspring. My mothers and sisters always ask Allah for guidance. Keep on asking Him. This is why when we read Surah Al-Fatiha, if you've ever thought of it, uh, we start off by praising Allah, declaring His praise and so on, and we only make one dua. There is only one supplication in that whole surah. And we repeat it every time we're praying our salah. There is one supplication. Do you know what it is? <laughs> Guide us to the straight path. That's all. There's no other prayer or supplication in Surah Al-Fatiha besides guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. We say it so many times in Salah every day. Guide us to the straight path. Are we genuine? Well, if we are, inshallah, we will be working towards the straight path. What's the point of saying, guide us to the straight path, guide us to the straight path, guide us to the straight path, guide us to the straight path. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And everything goes off. Your clothing is off. Everything is off. The late Michael Jackson is in your ears and everything is up. And we come back a little while later. Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. Don't play the fool with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are serious in saying guide us to the straight path, you will try your best to walk upon the straight path, to tread upon it. You will try your best to shrug off whatever evil thoughts and ideas and habits that may have been overtaking us uh, they are and we will try our best to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is why Allah says it is up to Allah it is his in his control but he also tells you you try and I'll do the rest you be sincere and your doors will open so Allah says whoever Allah guides for him there is no misleader may Allah guide us may Allah really guide us all Amen. Uh, Allah says is not Allah exalted in might the owner of retribution Allahu Akbar is Allah not strong? Is He not all powerful? The owner of might, the owner of retribution, which means He can revenge and He can actually uh, pay back. Is He not the, the, the owner, the sovereign, the one who has all power? The answer is yes, He does. So now what we're learning from this is be careful, do good deeds. And you know what? If you've made mistakes, then you'd better repent. May Allah grant us all goodness and repentance and may He elevate us. Amen. Then the question, or then in the next verse, Allah says, And if you ask them, which means the kuffar of Quraysh, the disbelievers at the time of Muhammad wasallam, they used to believe in Allah, but they added deities with Allah. So Allah says here, confirming that, He says, And if you were to ask them, who created the heavens and the earth? They would say Allah. They would say God Almighty. 
superior, supreme, one supreme power has created all this. So tell them, then have you considered what you invoke besides Allah? If Allah intended me harm, are they able to remove this harm? And if Allah intended me mercy, are they able to withhold this mercy? This is a question. Because when you ask them who created you and the heavens and the earth, they'll say Allah. But they're still worshipping sticks and stones and whatever else. So, so uh, the Prophet ﷺ is being told to ask them another question. That okay, if you're saying that Allah created me and the heavens and the earth and everything else, then those you are calling out to besides Allah, and the things that you are calling out to besides Allah, can they protect me from any harm that Allah wants to inflict upon me? Or can they hold back any goodness that Allah wants to bless me with? The answer is no. They know that nothing can happen. From the time of Abraham and even before the time of Ibrahim, may peace be upon him, Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam, he asked his father, Oh my father, you're worshipping these idols. Do they protect you when someone tries to slap you? Or can they uh, slap someone who intends to harm you? Or can they give you food? Or can they even eat themselves? Or can they help you see the way? And in fact, can they see the way themselves? And these were all simple but valid questions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to ask the relevant questions to the right people. And inshallah, we will get the correct answers. So this was a question. So Allah says at the end of that, say, sufficient for me is Allah. And upon Him alone, Rely the wise reliers. قُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَتَوَكَّلُ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ Say, Allah is enough for me, sufficient. And that's a dua we should all be making. حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَتَوَكَّلُ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ It's a good dua. You can even say, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Or, حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمُ Or, Kareem. Subhanallah, this is Allah. And these are the prayers and supplications we should be making. I do not have time to go into the deeper meanings of it. Uh, but uh, I hope that you would because uh, this shows that Allah is sufficient for us. If you have a problem, you just say, Hasbi Allah. Allah is enough for me. And Allah will protect you. You have to mean it genuinely, obviously. So here, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being told to say. So he is taught a dua. What is this dua? Hasbi Allah alayhi yatawakkalul mutawakkilun. Allah is enough for me. Allah is sufficient for me. And you know who lays their trust in Allah? Those who are the wise layers of trust. Those who know where to lay their trust, they lay their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to say something else. So let's read the verse. He says, Say, O my people, work according to your position, for indeed I am working, and you are going to know. You are going to know very soon. So what is the meaning of this verse? They were doing deeds, they were doing bad deeds. They were threatening and Allah said to Muhammad sallallahu just say that Allah is enough for me. And when they kept on threatening, Allah says, okay, you do whatever you're doing and let me carry on doing what I am doing and soon you will come to know who was right, who was wrong, what was happening, the judgment will come to pass and so on. So sometimes we have disputes in this world that we have to leave for the life after death. And these are some disputes. You have to just say, okay, do as you, you, you uh, believe or as you feel fit. And I am doing as I feel fit. And Allah will judge between us. But on merit, obviously, my message is much more powerful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength and the ability to not only understand the powerful message, but to adopt it, to work towards it and to preach it to others. Amen. So my mothers and sisters, Allah says thereafter, and you are going to know to whom will come a torment disgracing him and on whom will descend an enduring punishment. You will get to know very soon who is going to be punished. You threatening to punish me in this world? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you who is more deserving of the punishment. So Allah says, indeed, we sent down to you the book for the people in truth. This is the book. We sent it down to you. For who? For the people. For your information, you and I are from the people. We are the people. Allah sent it for me and for you. Obviously, the people was re referring to the people at the time and it extended to us all because the Quran is for us. And Allah sent it through the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it came 
as a gift to us from Allah, an instruction. This is why we always say, learn the Quran, read its meaning. If you know the meanings of the Quran deeply, nobody can fool you ever. Nobody will be able to lie to you about what Islam says and does not say because you know, you know the message of your maker. And this is something that's extremely important. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us knowledge and that which is beneficial. Amen. So indeed we sent down the book. We sent down to you the book for the people in truth. So whoever is guided, it is for the benefit of his own soul. And whosoever goes astray, only goes astray to its own detriment, which means to the soul's own detriment. And you are not a manager in authority over them. You are a messenger to deliver the message. You're not a manager. You don't have authority over them. So guidance is not in your hands. You can only guide them by showing them the path, but you cannot guide them by enforcing them to walk upon the path. This is why there were so many disbelievers at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet he was, he really wanted them to believe and some of them did not believe. Some of them believed later on. Yet the winners were those who accepted it immediately and recognized the truth. May Allah make us strong. May Allah strengthen us all. My mothers and sisters, we need to pray to Allah that he keep us from amongst those who are steadfast and he protect us from the devil and the devil's whispers. I mean, so Allah says, Verse number 42. Before I say the meaning of verse number 42, let me tell you something. My mothers and sisters, Allah removes the soul from the body when you go to sleep at night. Did you know that? Allah takes the body away. Uh, sorry, takes the soul away when you go to sleep. So you're gone to sleep. And then he says that, okay, if you, life is still written for you, then... We send it back into your body as you are awakened or as you wake up. We send it back into your body. And if death is written to you, we keep it. We don't send it back to you, back to the body. So the connection of the body and the soul in sleep somehow detached. How? Allah knows the detail. But this is the verse that we actually surrender to. Here it is. Let's read it. You'll understand it. Allah says, Allah takes the souls at the time of their death and those that do not die, He takes them away during their sleep. Did you hear that? Wow. Then He keeps those for which He has decreed death. He doesn't send them back. And He releases the others as they wake up from their sleep for a specified term. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. Now, Technology, medicine, science, whatever you want to call it, cannot explain exactly what sleep is all about. They have guessed, they have tried, but they'll confirm that 100% detail, we've got no clue. We don't know what goes on here. Something happens. They can, they can perhaps put you to sleep with an ejection, but they don't know exactly what goes on. They'll tell you, oh, it slows down and this happens. Well, you start dreaming. Well, what's dreams all about? They can't explain. So it's called a small death. That's your sleep, a small death. And the big death is when he keeps the soul. This is why one of the easiest deaths is when someone dies in their sleep. So easy, simple, gone. Not necessarily the best death, but the easiest, yes. It's very easy because your soul anyway is gone. And Allah says, we just keep it. So the sakarat are minimized, you know, the pangs of death. But that might not be the best way of having gone because sometimes if you die in a specific condition, you know, like those who died during childbirth and those who have death perhaps uh, whilst protecting their property and so on, they get a much higher rank. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May He take us away in a way that He knows is best for us. Amin. So, I don't think I heard a single Amin there. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us really the best of deaths. Amin. Allahu Akbar. Don't be frightened because you have to go. So do I. But you rather just say, oh Allah, take me in a nice way. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. You have no option. My mothers and sisters, no option. We have to go. We'd rather go nicely than to say, hey, I'm too scared to say Amin to that. So how will you go? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an easy death. Amin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He releases the others for a specified time. Indeed, in that are signs for people who give thought. Or have they taken other than Allah as intercessors say, even though they do not possess power.
power over anything, nor do they reason. How can they take intercessors besides Allah? They say, when you ask them, why are you worshipping these people? They say, they're going to bring us closer to Allah. So Allah says, why are you worshipping these intercessors? They say, no, these are intercessors. They will bring us closer to you. Allah says, how did you do that? Did I authorize that? Allahu Akbar. So this is why even in the next verse, Allah says, say to Allah belongs the right to allow intercession entirely. The right to allow intercession is belonging solely and only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will have the power of interceding on the day of judgment. That too will be, and it is, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And this is explained by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. He says, I'll be waiting for you at the pond known as Kawthar. And I'll be waiting there, recognizing you, calling out to Allah, saying, Oh Allah, this person is from my ummah, and interceding on behalf of the members of my ummah. May Allah grant us that intercession. Amen. But uh, he says, then there will come people that I will recognize and I'll try to call out, but Allah will deny them that. And Allah will say to me that, no, not these. You don't know what they did after you left. They turned back and they turned back and they did not follow uh, what you had brought and so on. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, do not embarrass me. What a big embarrassment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to adopt the, uh, the deen as best as possible and may he forgive us. Do you know what's the little secret? Well, it's not a little secret, but it's something great. Seek forgiveness a lot, a lot. Seek a lot of repentance and inshallah, you find a lot of goodness uh, in your day-to-day lives and even a lot of hope for the akhirah. And, and you know, you won't be a person who's fearing so much to say, hey, I'm going to die one day. No, you tried your best. Alhamdulillah, we've got no other option but to hope in the mercy of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Verse number 44, Allah says, Say, to Allah belongs intercession entirely. To Allah belongs the right to allow intercession entirely. To Him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. Then to Him you will be returned. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says thereafter, And when Allah is mentioned alone, the hearts of those who do not believe in the hereafter shrink with aversion. But when those worshipped other than Him are mentioned, immediately they rejoice. You know how powerful this verse is? Allah says that those who's, who have weakness of Iman, when you talk about Allah and His words and His kalam and the Qur'an and to worship Allah alone and not to engage in shirk and not to associate partners with Allah, their hearts shrink. They are saddened. They say, what's this person talking about? Why are they always talking about shirk and we should stay away from shirk and shirk and shirk? Well, it's a sign that your hearts are weak and are distant from Allah, that you are getting irritated by the speech about shirk and abstaining from it. This is what Allah is saying, that look, those whose hearts hearts are weak, those whose hearts are weak and they do not have true belief in the akhirah and the life after, they, whenever things, whenever Allah is mentioned alone, Allah alone, one, 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 they get irritated and, and their hearts shrink. They don't even want to hear about it. But the minute you talk about something besides Allah, oh, they're happy, excited. Wow, listen to this. They're telling us, stand near the tree and you get the power. Wow, listen to that. Oh, they're telling us, go to the fortune teller. And you know, he's accurate, man. He predicted that my eggs would come out raw this morning. Wow. That was just a laugh. Anyway. So, but this is what people do. And you know, then they start saying, okay, this, this saint is going to tell us this and that. And you know, when you talk about this saint and this thing and that thing, okay, fair enough, we respect our saints. But at the same time, we don't worship them. And another thing is, if anyone was pious and good, they should have called you towards Allah, not towards themselves. Anyone who is pious, one of the signs of piety is, they never ever blow their own trumpet. Rather, they call out to Allah and they call you and I to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when people say, oh, this guy is a very bad person and he's a Dajjal and he's a this and he's a that. So what? Allah protect us. If the person is calling towards himself, then indeed he's a Dajjal. But if the person is calling towards Allah, then he's just a messenger telling you to do good. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us messengers and may he not make us people who call towards themselves. So this verse is so powerful and I love reading it, this verse of Surah Al-Zumar, because really it wakes me up, my, it wakes me up and it helps me along. Verse number 45 of Surah number 39, when Allah says, when Allah alone is mentioned, then those who don't have proper belief in the hereafter, their hearts shrink with aversion. But when everything else is mentioned besides Allah, they immediately rejoice. And this is why if you were to tell someone, my brother, my sister, you're going through a problem, make dua to Allah. They say, oh, I've been making dua. But the minute you tell them, take 20 lemons and start taking 50 roses and do 50 things, they, you, 
Yay, that's going to work. And they do it so enthusiastically. And they tell everyone else to do it. Why? Their belief in the hereafter is weak. That's all it is. Here's the verse. Allah is telling you, if you get upset or if you ha- uh, if feel a little bit weak when Allah is mentioned and the power of Allah and the verses of Allah and worshipping Allah alone is mentioned and you start feeling something in your heart negative and you feel it's not enough, there's a weakness in your iman. And, and when you get excited about everything else, when people tell you to believe in all superstitious things and this and that and you know, and we start believing in all other things besides Allah and when they mention other people, you know sometimes when you read a verse of the Quran, people get upset. But the minute you say such and such a person said this statement, they get so excited and they say, wow, you know, well, that's a sign of weakness of Iman. By right, I'm not saying you should not be impressed by what some people might have taught you in terms of goodness. But the first line, the first line of impression should be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and may he guide us. So these are powerful verses. And towards the end, Allah says, and say, O oh Allah, creator of the heavens. Wow, this is a dua. This is a dua. Allah is telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Say, O oh Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth, knower of the unseen and the witnessed, you will judge between your servants concerning that over which they used to differ. Allahu Akbar. You know when people are in dispute, this is a powerful dua. Sometimes people want to oppress you. They are passing wrong judgment against you. You say this. اللهم فاطر السماوات والأرض عالم الغيب والشهادة أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون الله أكبر and Allah says and if those who did wrong had all that is in the earth entirely and the like of it with it which means double they would attempt to ransom themselves thereby from the worst of the punishment on the day of resurrection so people would want to pay to say hey I'm going to the fire take some money Take the wealth I had, take everything I had, take my child, take my spouse, take everyone. Allahu Akbar. This is what the Quran says. Allah says, that's not going to happen. They're going to try that. And there they will appear to them from Allah that which they had not taken into account. They knew about it, but they never considered it thoroughly. So Allah says, no ways. This day is the day of deeds, not the day of trying to compense with uh, currency that's not acceptable here. Because dollars and cents and everything else and gold and silver is not a currency that, accept, that is acceptable once you die. No, whilst you're alive, you can convert it into the currency that's going to be used on the other side, known as deeds. So from $50, make them 500,000 deeds. Yes, when you get to the Akhirah, your deeds will be weighed. You have more? Yes, you can... You can actually be freed from the fire because you've got more good deeds. This is why we say, let's keep on doing good deeds. Allah says, and they will appear for them the evils that they had earned. And they will be enveloped by that which they used to ridicule. When you tell people about punishment, they start laughing at you. When you tell people that there's hell, when you tell people that there is heaven, when you tell people that there is this, nowadays they just laugh at you. Some of the people just laugh. But Allah says, oh, they used to ridicule, they used to laugh. Now they're enveloped by the same thing that they used to laugh about. And then Allah says, when adversity touches man, he calls upon us and we bestow him a favor from us. Then he says, Allahu Akbar. This is what I was speaking about earlier. That when adversity affects us, something bad happens to us, we quit to call out to Allah. A stone hit me on my head. Ya Allah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. But you know what happened? I made a big profit and I earned $50,000. Whoa. Now what happens? First thing we think about is to buy stuff and to do this. And to do. May Allah guide us. I hope that's not the case with us. But it happens in some cases where people tend to lose. you got good health, good everything. Everything is superb, lovely. And we forget Allah. Let me give you a quick example. I know I've overshot the time, but don't worry. Uh, Ramadan is around the bend, so we're just practicing. Mashallah. So... There was a man, right? This builder. And the head man was trying to draw his attention. So he threw a $20 bill at him. And the builder carried on working. He threw another $20 bill at him. The builder carried on working. He threw another $20 bill at him. The builder kept on working. So he decided, okay, let me throw a stone. He threw a stone and immediately the builder looked up. Hey, what's going on? Now, why we say this is because to draw the attention, when goodness was coming, the attention was not drawn. The minute something struck, immediately the attention was drawn. That happens in our lives. Allah throws sustenance in our direction. But we never look to Him. 
And the minute suddenly you diagnosed with something, Ya Allah, where's my salah? I'm up for fajr, I'm up for tahajjud. Why? I got a problem. Well, that was the little stone. It was a gift. It was a gift. Allah says, hang on, you know what? Come back to us quickly, quickly. We're giving you so much that you've forgotten us. Rather, when we give you, you must remember us. So that at least when, you know, when the, the days come, when you're tested, you're already close to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us closeness. So these are some of the beautiful verses. The last verse that I'd like to speak about today uh, is the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, those before them had already said it. Allahu Akbar. Let's just go through verse number 49. When adversity touches man, he calls upon us. Then when we bestow him with a favor from us, he says, I have only been given it because of my own knowledge. Rather, it is a trial. But most of them do not know. Allah says, those before them had already said it, but they were not availed by what they used to earn. And the evil consequences of what they earned struck them. And those who have wronged of these people will be struck or afflicted by the evil consequences of what they earned. And they will not cause failure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Really. Allah is the one who extends provision. He is the one who sustains. He is the one who gives goodness. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who extends provision from whom he wills and restricts it from whom he wills. Indeed, in that there are signs of people who believe. You believe in Allah, you will realize sustenance is in His hands. You just work towards Allah in a way that is permissible and halal. Whatever comes in your direction, that's from Allah. The minute you do prohibited things, you are answerable. So my mothers and sisters, we've learned a lot from these verses. I think this is such a big cleanser just before Ramadan where we can actually start looking back into our deeds and earn the pleasure of Allah. None knows when they're going to die. None knows when they're going to return to Allah. But the day we do return, we'd love that Allah subhanahu subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and that we earn jannah and that we can be the blessed may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all goodness and may he bless yourselves and your offspring and us all may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed forgive us wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik